He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, in case you don't know me, my name is Andrew. It is a privilege and a pleasure to be able to bring in God's word to you. Now, before I uh, start, um, uh, I'm not sure if many of you know this, but uh, as, as a church network, um, there's Grace Bible Church in Holland Park here, and then there's Holland Park, uh, no, then there's Logan, and then there's Corinda. And as a network, we've been going through this Reformation series. Um, and so I've already uh, delivered this sermon to um, Corinda and Logan, but each time I delivered them, um, I started off and, and uh, forgot to pray. Usually I don't miss these things, but I forgot. So now I've put in massive bold letters, pray. And so would you just join me in prayer just before we start? Father in heaven, oh God, you are a wonderful God. Lord, we thank you for this time that we have together. We thank you for the Lord's Day, the day that we gather on the day that Jesus rose from the grave. God, it is hard to be able to capture your glory and efforts by mere human words, my feeble words, will never do justice to how incomparably glorious you are. But my prayer is that you would give me unction um, to declare your word truthfully and faithfully, that to some extent, we as your people might get a grasp or a glimpse of how truly wonderful you are in the person and work of your son, Jesus Christ. So, Father, we pray that you are with us during our time this morning. In his name alone, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, like I said... <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we, we've been going through this series on the Reformation, um, and what the Reformation is about is uh, it happened during the 1500s, and it was it talked about five essential doctrines to the Christian faith. And we've been going through these, not in quite the same order um, as they're presented. Only Logan, unfortunately, got that privilege to do it. But what these five doctrines are is that, first of all, that the Bible, Scripture, is what gives us alone our ability to understand all matters pertaining to life and to salvation to our salvation. And so these five essential truths, what they look like is that we understand God's plan of salvation through Scripture alone and that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and that all of this, all of this is to the glory of God alone. But when we talk about the Reformation, um, it's easy to think that uh, these truths just came out of nowhere, as if, you know, Christianity had dropped off the map right after the last apostle um, died, the apostle John died, um, that all of a sudden, you know, there's nothing else to know about Christianity, it's dropped off the map. But this is not exactly the case. Instead, the historic Christian faith. It continued to thrive and it continued to be built up upon the essential truths that uh, were established by Christ in his word. And over these centuries, you had great men of the faith, men like Irenaeus and Athanasius and Augustine, all these guys and, um, with funny names. They were starting to proclaim these wonderful truths about what Christianity was, and they would beautifully articulate doctrines, essential doctrines of Christianity. But also over the centuries, what you had are heresies or false truths about Christianity to beginning to emerge, and they would kind of run in parallel. Often you would find a heresy emerge, and that would force the church to articulate what sound doctrine is or what sound teaching is about the Bible. And so, but as, the, as these things were going on, what you had was uh, these truths or these false truths, these heresies, there were different degrees of how bad they were, and there were different in degrees of how prominent they were. And so when we look at the medieval times around the 1500s, the uh, 1000 to 1500s, these began to become 
really prominent within the life of the church and really quite terrible as well in, the, in these natures. And so what the, the Reformation did was oppose these false truths and, and brought us back to those fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith. And the reason why that I say this is that the Reformation was not like this rediscover or this discovery of Christianity as some new truths that we could have. Instead, what it was was a, a radical reclaiming of the historic Christian faith. We, we as the people of God, we as Christians, we have our lineage and we have our links all the way back to when Christ founded the church upon his resurrection. And, and it is the same truth that uh, we hold to that Peter proclaimed at Pentecost and it has continued to be proclaimed every single Sunday on the Lord's Day that we find ourselves here part of that great work of God. And so um, the big player in all of this the big player uh, who, who kind of uh, uh, was the architect outside of God, of course, um, was Martin Luther. <clears throat> when, now, with Martin Luther, I wanted to give you guys uh, three stories about Martin Luther, um, just to give us a sense of what was going on in the Reformation. And so the first one was his call to ministry. And it's, it's not kind of like the regular call where, you know, you're sitting in church and the pastor's like, hey think you've got the talents, man, you should, you should come up or you should check it out. Not one of those calls. Instead, he found himself in a thunderstorm in the middle of the field, not sure what he was doing, but he found himself really frightened about losing his life. And so what he ended up doing as this, um, you know, uh, Roman Catholic guy, he found himself praying to one of the, the saints and he goes, ah, oh, if you would just keep me safe from this thunderstorm, um, I'm going to leave my law degree behind and I'm going to pursue ministry, I'm going to become a priest and serve God with the rest of my life. And sure enough, Martin Luther survived, um, and his parents were kind of upset. They're like, why are you giving up law degree and a wonderful career of prominence and prestige, and you're pursuing a vocational ministry? But that's where he found himself. So that's the first story. Second story is that when he's found himself in uh, as, as a priest, as a monk, having gone through the process, um, people would say, why, why do you love God? And you say, love God. Sometimes I hate him. And it was this confronting uh, truth that he, uh, emotion that he grappled with because, you see, he would, he'd read the psalmist's writings in Psalm 119 and, and what he would see in Psalm 119 is someone saying, your law is like honey to my mouth and sweet to my lips and it's, it's good for the soul. And yet Martin Luther instead found himself in a very different situation. You'd have people, because you know, they'd have to go through their regular practice of penance, and, and all the other priests, the Catholic priests, they would find themselves going up into uh, confession and making a confession of sins, and they'd be done in a few minutes. And then good old Martin Luther would come on in, and you know, he'd be confessing for hours and hours about all these different things. And it's like, Martin, give it up. You're, you're doing fine. But he could not find relief in his conscience. He could not find a relief in his burden that he was a sinner before a holy God. And so he'd be confronted by things of, of God? <laughs> Sometimes I hate him. And it would plague him and plague him that he could never be relieved of his conscience, that he had the forgiveness of sins. And so then that brings us to our third story, which is the story of his salvation. The story that, that began to start to work towards the great truth that began um, to be articulated in the Reformation. And now he was, he was teaching from a series of books. He was teaching from Romans, from the Psalms, from Hebrews and, for Galatians, and from Galatians, which for me, I don't know about yourselves, but that's not a bad book to come to comprehending the gospel. And as he's going through Romans, he finally understood it. He understood that the just shall live by faith. All this time he found himself wanting to justify himself before God and look righteous before God and be clean before God. And nothing he ever did could get him to that place. And finally he understood that all I need to do is put my faith alone in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And that is how I will live my life to the end of my days. And the burden and the weight and the, 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 uh, all the, the heaviness of sin Relieved, And that, that is what then formed what we stand to now 500 years onwards as part of that stream of God's, God's radical reclaiming of, of uh, what the Catholic Church was trying to steal and, and, and knock down. And so this is where we find ourselves uh, talking about today, that we are saved by grace through faith alone, alone, in Christ alone. This is the, the topic of, of this final 
uh, sermon that we're going to be covering is that we are saved by Christ alone. And so we're going to unpack that. And what I wanted to do this morning was I wanted to ask two questions. We're going to answer two questions this morning. And the first one is, what is involved in God's plan of salvation? That is the first question that we're asking this morning. What is involved in God's plan of salvation? And the second question that we're asking is, what makes Christ alone uniquely qualified to accomplish this plan? So first, what is involved in God's plan of salvation? Now, to be able to answer this question, we need to get to the beginning. And I'm not talking about the beginning of Colossians. I'm not even talking about the beginning of the New Testament. What I'm talking about is the beginning of Scripture, Genesis, at the beginning of time where God creates creation, where creation was created. Excuse me. See, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created all things that were visible and all things that were invisible. And we see in Genesis chapter 1, we see a God who is poetic in his creative activity. He doesn't just care about what he creates. He also cares about how he creates it. And so in days 1, 2, and 3, God forms creation. He creates this sort of framework. And then in days 4, 5, and 6, God fills creation. And so you see this pattern that God Fills, God fills what he forms. So on days one, on, excuse me, on day one, God forms the light and he calls it good. And then in day four, we see that he fills the light with the sun, the moon, and the stars, and it is good again. <clears throat> then on the second day, God separates the waters from the sky. He forms them and he calls, and oh, sorry, it actually leaves it out. I, John Mackay came up afterwards and he's like, no. Wasn't there. Um, So anyway, then on day five, God fills the sea with creatures and he fills the air with creatures. And this is good too. And then on the third day, God forms the land with vegetation. And then on the sixth day, he fills this land with creatures. And then he says something different. He says, I will create a creature in my own image, a creature that is different from the rest of creation. The invisible God says that he will create man and woman in his own image. That when creation would see man, they would see the visible reflection of the invisible God. They will see the image of God. And as I said, brothers and sisters, God fills what he forms. And almost like this bookend to God's own creative activity, we first see that the heavens and the earth were created, and that when they were created, the earth was without form. And then over the course of the days, we see that the earth begins to receive form. And then when God creates a creature in his own image, the earth has form. And so God directs those in his image to fill the earth. And so now we begin to see the wheel set in motion of what God's desire is. His desire is that humanity will reflect who he is in his rule, who he is in his dominion, and who he is in his own creativity, creative activity, by their rule, by their dominion, and by their own creative activity, such that as they fill the earth, when creation sees humanity, they would see the image of God. And God would have a relationship with his image, and it would be this harmonic symphony that declares the glories of God in its fullness. So at the end of this day, the end of the final day of creation, God looked upon all that he created and he said, very good. And so, brothers and sisters, from Genesis chapter 1, we need to understand two things as it relates to our time this morning and to our first question of what is involved in God's plan of salvation. So the first thing is that God's creation was very good. See, God doesn't create bad things. He doesn't create useless things. The same God who says that not one idle word should come out of our mouth certainly had no idle word come out of his mouth as he spoke things into being. We have a God who is a God with passion and creativity and beauty, and it was all displayed on heaven and earth as he put these things into being. And You see, when an artist, when he creates a masterpiece, when he creates a masterwork of art, everything has purpose. Every color, every texture, every object, every stroke of the brush, everything has purpose. And if this is the case for an artist, 
then how much more so for the God of all creation, who not only wants to create something beautiful, but he creates it in a way that is like poetry. This is the first thing that you need to understand. Second thing that you need to understand as it relates to our question is that God placed man in charge of his creation on earth. God says, I will make them in my image. And like a king, they're going to rule over all that is visible in my creation, in my creative order. And to me, brothers and sisters, this is an absolutely incomprehensible thought that we could be given such a task. I can imagine the great theologian and poet and king, King David. I can imagine him as the king of Israel sitting, sitting on his throne, opening up holy scripture and finding himself reading Genesis 1 and meditating on it. And as he's meditating on it, being consumed with awe and wonder with God's creative activity and the beauty of his creation, so consumed with awe and and by these spirit-filled words, he finds himself making his own utterances by the spirit of God as he's so consumed with awe and he finds himself saying, oh Lord, our Lord, How majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? You have crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And now, of course, when we, when we look at this psalm, we understand that it has its sure and true fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ. But there is a very real sense that as David penned this psalm, looking at Genesis 1, he understood what God's purpose for those who were created in his own image was. And brothers and sisters, this is the second thing that you need to understand this morning, is that God placed man in charge to rule over the work of his hands. And this, this I find as a truth that is almost impossible to fathom, and something that was almost impossible to fathom. But what was the purpose of all this? Why did God create creation? Because until we know why God created creation, we're not going to understand his plan of salvation. So why? Why did he create creation? And You see, brothers and sisters, as David says in Psalm 19, he says, the heavens declare the glories of God The expanse proclaims the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech, and night after night, they communicate knowledge. See, brothers and sisters, all of creation was made to be a theater for God's glory, that in one harmonious symphony, creation was to declare the glories of God and the works of his hand. And each each part of creation, each part of creation was to play its own part in this pouring forth speech and declaring his glory. So just to imagine this for a second, to the left you had these deep tones of his power that came through. The shining of the sun, the heights of the mountain, and the swirling of the galaxies, they would display traces of God's power. And then to the right, to the right were the softer tones of his beauty, You had in the sound of the flowing streams over brooks, in the sweet song of birds in the air, and in that technicolor horizon that begins and ends each each new day, they would display traces of his beauty. And then to the center of this symphony, to the center were these melodious tones of his goodness. The lion would lie with the lamb, the bees would help pollinate the plants, and flowers would produce these sweet aromas. They would display traces of his goodness. And between all of these parts were other instruments of creation that would declare his intelligence, his kindness, his graciousness, his goodness, his faithfulness, and his creativity. In other words, creation was to declare who God is in all his glory by possessing traces of him. But where all creation would possess traces of him in man, in humanity, was something very different. In man was the image of God, not traces of God. It was the image of God. Of every attribute that God could communicate to a creature, it was given in humanity. 
of course not his ever presence and his omniscience and his benevolence and things like that, but everything, every attribute that could be given, it was in humanity. Man was in the image of God. Humanity was the pinnacle of God's creation that was to reveal to the rest of creation the image of the invisible God. And so when man rightly exercised his rule and his dominion, he would reflect, he would reflect God's image throughout all creation and God would be most known in creation and God would be most glorified in creation in his image filling the earth. This is God's plan. So what a tragic day it was then. What a tragic day it was in the garden when Adam chose to eat of the fruit the fruit that God said about, do not eat of this fruit or you will surely die. On that day, Adam failed to be the image of God and the image of God was defaced in creation. And its effects were far greater, far greater than simply humanity's death. Death abounded in God's good creation as God declared to Adam, cursed is the ground because of you. All of creation became subject to futility. All of creation that possessed traces of God was no longer able to declare the glories of God in the way that it was made to do. And so we find ourselves asking this question. We continue to ask this question. What is involved in God's plan of salvation? Because depending on what you see, the problem is, is how you're going to be answering this question. So, to give you guys a story, um, when I was a child and um, my family, we were building a house. And as we were building the house, uh, we were living with, with others um, uh, just to stay with them. And one of my strongest memories while I was staying with them were the cigarettes. They were avid smokers. Now, I don't know if you, if you uh, have smoked cigarettes in your life or if you've been around persons with, who have smoked cigarettes in your life, but there's one thing that you can know about cigarettes is that they get into everything. They get into absolutely everything. They don't just get into your lungs, they get into everything, everything, everything into your teeth, into your hair, into your clothes. You can smell it permeating through your skin, they get into your skin, and if you smoke it in the same place, it'll get into your ceiling and into your walls and into your furniture, and once it's there, it ain't ever gone. It stays there. It stays there in such a way that you walk out, you open the door to air it out, you put on your Glen 20, and you shh, it ain't going. It stays there. The stench stays. And brothers and sisters, this is what has happened to the universe. Sin has made its way all the way through the universe such that wherever there's sin, you will see the curse and death. You will not see one square inch in God's good, visible creation um, that God gave man dominion over that is not being corrupted by sin. See, since man failed to be the image of God, creation is not what it ought to be, it's not like what it ought to be, and it doesn't function like it ought to do. There is something fundamentally wrong and missing since man has defaced the image of God. And I hope that as you have been going, as I've been going through this, you're beginning to see God's plan of salvation as being a little bit clearer. See, it's so easy to make salvation about me. If I just have the forgiveness of sins, then it's all going to be good. And when I, the thing is, though, when I make salvation about me, then it's easy to think that I could potentially save myself. It's easy to think that, well, if I just lived a good enough life, if I just did enough good works, if I just went to church, if I just went and prayed enough and things like this, then maybe I could have had salvation. But even, let's, go, let's change it up a bit. Let's just say, okay, let's say I wasn't corrupted by original sin. Let's say that I didn't commit these sins because, yeah, sure, I understand now that I've committed sin, that I'm in need of God's grace. But let's just imagine this situation where I didn't have God, uh, a sin in my nature. Maybe I could have done it. Maybe I could have made my way to heaven. I could have just lived the good life and, and entered salvation. Imagine this scenario for a second. Imagine that you live this perfect life or, um, uh, and you make it to heaven. Or imagine for a second that there was a Savior and the climax of His work was that he saved you so that you could get to go to heaven. And then at the end of the day, you look God in his wonderful face and you say, I am so glad I made it to heaven. I'm so glad I made it to heaven. And as you say this and you think that his plan of salvation is complete because you're in heaven, his creation is in futility and his image is defaced in creation and there's rebels running the earth. Would you be content with that as a situation? 
Would you be content with a situation where God is less than all glorious and beautiful and lovely? Would you be content with that? So you see, brothers and sisters, salvation, God's plan of salvation, it is not about you. It's about his glory. And yes, it involves your sin, and God has a plan to deal with that, but it is not about you. It is about his glory. This is the final and great truth of the Reformation, that all things are to the glory of God alone, all things to the glory of God alone. So then that leaves us with this question, what would it take for God to be glorified? And you see, brothers and sisters, in answering this question, we can finally begin to answer what is involved in God's plan of salvation. So what would it take? And this, the answer is simple. God must win. God must win. If the curse continues to exist, then God has lost. If death hasn't been defeated, then God has lost. If sin, if that which brought the curse and it brought death into the creation that he loves, and if this sin that has defaced his own image, if this sin hasn't been totally destroyed, then God has lost. In other words, the pinnacle of his creation. If this image image has not been restored, then God has lost. And so, so, brothers and sisters, for God to win... For God to win, creation and his image must be gloriously renewed. The thing is, is that creation will only be gloriously renewed once his image is gloriously restored. It functions in that order. His image was defaced and then creation had its problems. And so that is the same order that creation will be renewed in the renewal of his image. And I hate to break it to you, but this does not require you or me. So to answer our first question, so to answer our first question of what is involved in God's plan of salvation, it is this. God plans to redeem his image and his creation so that heaven and earth are an incorruptible theater for his glory. It's a plan of cosmic proportions. His plan of salvation is one of absolutely cosmic proportions. In fathomable proportions. And that, brothers and sisters, leads us into both our second question and into our text this morning. That if God's plan of salvation is to redeem His image, uh, to renew His image and His creation such that all of creation is this incorruptible theater for His glory, then our second question is what makes Christ alone uniquely qualified to accomplish this plan? Because if I can provide a shorter definition of what salvation means, It's a one-word definition. It means to be rescued. It means to be rescued from this corruption of a curse-ridden world into a kingdom, away from sin and death, into a kingdom that is incorruptible. That is what salvation is. And here, brothers and sisters, is where we find ourselves onto the on-ramp of our text this morning. We find ourselves in the first chapter of the letter to Colossians, in verse 13, where Paul writes to us, He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son He loves. So what does this mean practically for us? How does this rescue happen? Well, in verse 14, He says, In Him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. See, brothers and sisters, God plans to renew His image and His creation so that heaven and earth are this incorruptible theater for His glory. But if we as those... as uh, As us who are made in his image, if we have any hope in this salvation, it will be because God has firstly dealt with sin and he has dealt with sin for those who have defaced his image. And if we have any hope, it is because he has granted us forgiveness in a very gracious act. So again, what makes Christ alone uniquely qualified to accomplish his plan of salvation? Read verse 15 to 17 with me. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. Now, before we begin answering our second question, if I could indulge you, all in a little bit of a quick detour. 
Um, the reason why I wanted to read verse 15 and 17 together is because people can easily get tripped up on that word, firstborn. You know, some have used this single word to suggest that Christ is the creature and not the creator. And the fact is that we could point to all of the New Testament scripture, all of the Old Testament scripture outside of Colossians to dis- demonstrate and show incomprehensibly that Christ is the creator. But I've got a fancy principle instead that I wanted to give to you guys. And that principle is going to get us out of this conundrum. And it's what I like to call the, um, the keep reading on principle. And basically, this is how it works. Something doesn't make sense. Keep reading on. <laughs> That's all. That's it. That's it. Keep reading on. Scripture answers itself. And so let's do this. Let's apply this keep reading on principle. Notice that the first word that happens right after he is the firstborn of all creation, the next word is for. And that word for seeks to clarify for us exactly what Paul means by firstborn. He says, for all things were created by him. In fact, in the Greek, Paul throws the word the, the word the, he throws this before saying all things. So it literally reads, the all things. So it goes, for the all things of the created order were created by him. Notice that it doesn't say that Christ created some of the things. And notice that it doesn't say that Christ created most of the things. No, it says that Christ created the all things. Christ created all all things, and it's a matter of totality, absolutely everything in heaven and absolutely everything on earth, everything in every realm, everything visible, everything invisible was created by Christ, through Christ, and for Christ. He is before all things, and by him all things continue to exist, all things. So when we apply this keep reading on principle, it's clear that the language of firstborn is to indicate supremacy. Like I said, we could point to the firstborn language, like one in Psalm 89 that uses this language to indicate this supremacy that affirms Paul's understanding of it, but we don't need to, because you guessed it. We keep reading on. So, now the question that we're looking to answer is this. The question we're looking to answer is, what makes Christ alone uniquely qualified to accomplish his plan of salvation? So verse 15 to 17 again. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and by him all things hold together. Do you hear the traces of Genesis 1 coming through? When God created man in his own image, this is what he said. This is what he commanded. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and every, excuse me, and every creature that crawls on the earth. The second half of verse 16 again. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Now, yes, this means that Christ created the cosmic powers, and yes, this means that Christ created all the earthly authorities, but it also means something else. It also means that Christ created Adam. And if Christ, and if it is through Christ that Adam was created, then that means that Adam was created in the image of Christ. He was created in Christ's image. And so, as we were looking at Genesis chapter 1, we saw that pattern, that God fills what he forms, and Christ formed Adam from the dust into the image that he would truly fill. Verse 15 again, he is the image, Christ is the image of the invisible God. Brothers and sisters, God plans to renew his image and his creation so that heaven and earth are this incorruptible theater for his glory. And so the first reason that Christ alone is uniquely qualified to accomplish this grand cosmic plan of salvation is because of this. It's because of this. Christ alone can renew his image and creation. God alone, the God of creation, can renew his image and his creation. Christ alone alone can renew his image and creation. Only God himself knows what he looks like, 
Only, the God, only God himself knows what he looks like, and only God himself knows what creation ought to sound like. He knows how, the, how creation is supposed to declare his glory. So think about this for a second. Think about this in relation to creation, that on the way to Jerusalem, as Jesus is going to Jerusalem, on the way to the cross, his followers were declaring his praises, and they were saying, blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace be on earth and glory in the heavens and the highest heavens. And then at this, the Pharisees started to tell Jesus, tell your followers to be silent. And Jesus responds by saying this, I tell you, if they were to keep silent, the stones would cry out. The stones would cry out. There is a time, there is a time when you could have gone up and looked at a stone and been like, whoa, that is glorious. This stone is Beautiful. It is declaring the glories of God. And the stones would have cried out so that Jesus would make his way to the cross if his followers were silent. This is something that is incomprehensible. And we need to understand that only God himself knows what a creation that declares his glory ought to sound like. And in Christ, as we look at humanity and the renewal of his image, in Christ, we see the true image of God. Something that was never seen ever in heaven and on earth, especially on earth, ever before. We see him in his love. We see him in his compassion. We see him in his kindness and his grace and his mercy. We see him in his passion for righteousness and we see him in his selflessness. In all that we are not, we see him. And so in Christ, brothers and sisters, we see how far short we truly fall from the image and the glory of God. We see in Christ how glorious the image of God actually is. And so when people start to think that maybe I could have done it, you don't even know what you were saving yourself from and you don't even know what you were saving yourself to. There is no way that any human in all of creation could have accomplished God's cosmic plan of salvation because only God himself knows what the true image of himself looks like. Christ alone can renew his image and his creation. Now to move off that point, um, to tell you guys a little bit of a story. I don't know if uh, you are at all like me, but I am, um, I'm quite terrible at making resolutions. Um, it, takes, it takes me a while before resolutions stick. And so now my latest one is my desire to eat healthier, um, to have more salads and, and things like that. And now I've made this effort a few times, made this effort a few times, and I have failed multiple times, but this time... I think it's going to work. I've, I've tried to persuade people. I'm like, no, you know, this is going to work. This is going to work out for me. And they're like, it's going to be different this time, Andrew. What is going to be different? How is this going to at all be different? I'm like, <laughs> I've got something. And I explained to them that I've bought one of these um, uh, vegetable chopper things so that like, you slice the vegetable and you put it there and, you're, and, and you know, it chops the vegetables. And, and uh, you know, I'm, just, I'm like, it's easy. I'm just going to throw my tomato and throw my, throw my cucumber, I've got a salad. And I mean, you see, my biggest inhibition for eating healthy was, was um, uh, my laziness. <laughs> and so now that this is going to happen, I am going to eat salads and I'm going to be healthy. You, you need to know this. Only problem is, is that when I get hungry, I'm just like, I just want Maccas. <laughs> you know, this, that's it. Now, you might be thinking, what does this have to do? Actually, I should just say, is that like I told Roy this, and Roy is like, Andrew, do not watch daytime TV because you are going to lose all your money on all those things. And I'm like, no, 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 it's fine. Um, <laughs> but you see, as we, as we look at our text, as we look at our text, because if you're wondering what this is all about, there is a question that is popping up. As we are trying to understand what makes Christ alone uniquely qualified to accomplish his plan of salvation, popping out the burning question that we see is what is going to be different this time? See, I brought that home. You know, like, where? There it is. How is it going to be different this time? How is it possible that once I am saved, I'm not going to recapitulate Adam's story, that once Christ has redeemed the universe, what is going to be different? What's going to be different? So to answer that, read verse 18 and 19 with me. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. 
For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. See, brothers and sisters, verse 15 to 17, they tell us that Jesus is supreme over creation. Verse 18 tells us that Jesus is supreme over the new creation. We're no longer going to be relying on a mortal ruler to lead humanity and the new creation. This time, it will be different because not a mere mortal will, because Christ will. In other words, he is the head of the body, the church. In other words, Christ is the head of the new humanity, and we are organically, if God chooses to save us, we are organically connected to him and his leadership and his rule. And he is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead. In other words, Christ is the beginning of the new creation. In Christ alone, we both have the head of the new humanity, and we also have the beginning of the new creation, so that he might come to have first place in everything. The God who is perfect and holy and righteous and just and creative and intelligent and powerful and good and kind and love. This is the one who will rule the new creation. So the reason why, the second reason why of what makes Christ alone uniquely qualified to accomplish this plan of salvation is because only the God of creation can rule an incorruptible new creation. In other words, Christ alone is the one who can rule an incorruptible and new creation and we find ourselves in Him. So how do we get there? How do we get to the new beginning How do we get to this dawn of the new creation, the place where Christ is the leader of the new humanity and the conductor of the new creation? How do we get to this place, the place where there is no more disease, no more death, no more suffering? How do we get there? And how do we know that things aren't going to be the same as last time? So, brothers and sisters, we found ourselves um, uh, understanding creation through the first chapters of the Bible. So it's only fitting that we understand the recreation through the last chapters of the Bible. In the revelation of Jesus Christ to the Apostle John. Now, in this revelation, in this revelation, John receives this glorious vision of how all things are going to end. And in the finality of this glorious vision, as things are reaching greater and more glorious heights, John sees this holy city from heaven that's coming down to earth. So, what we're seeing is the invisible joining with the visible, heaven and earth reunited once more. A place where there is no more tears, no more pain, no more death, no more suffering. That ancient prayer that Christ directed us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This prayer in the end of Revelation was truly, fully, and finally answered. So why is this going to happen? How do we get there? See, the, 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 the holy city that is coming down from heaven to earth, in this revelation, John says it is called the New Jerusalem. And its dimensions, its height, its width, its depth, they're all the same. In other words, they, it is, it's a cube. It's a cube. And what's glorious, brothers and sisters, about a cube is that there is only one place in all of Scripture where you find something constructed that has the dimensions of a cube. That place is the most holy place. It is the holy of holies, the inner sanctum. In this most holy place is the place where the presence of God was. This was the place where God would meet the representative of humanity. This was the place. And so what the new Jerusalem coming from heaven to earth, what this signifies is that God would live with humanity once more. And he would do it forever. God would live with humanity once more. And you see, brothers and sisters, in this new Jerusalem, in this most holy place, was not only where the presence of God was to meet humanity, but it was also the place where sins are forgiven. Because where sin is removed, only where sin is removed, a holy God could truly dwell. The place where heaven and earth find peace is the place of atonement. The place where a holy God and a cursed earth will be reunited is the place where sins are forgiven. So how do we get to the new new creation? How do we get to this place? How do we get to the beginning? Read verse 19 with me. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. (laughs) 
See, brothers and sisters, when it says, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, that word dwell is not the same word of used by in, uh, excuse me, that word dwell is not the same dwell that we see at the beginning of John's letter, uh, uh, sorry, of John's gospel account where he says that Christ took on flesh and dwelt among us. It's not the same word, and it's not the same word at the end of Christ's revelation to John, where John declares that God would make his dwelling with humanity, among us, with us. It's not the same word. It's not the same word in the Greek. No, it's, this is a different kind of dwell. It's more intense. It's more intimate. It's kind of like that saying, home is, home is where the heart is, that this, this is the place it was meant to be. See, God would fill the image that he formed and that in Christ, what this is saying, in Christ to the very finest of details, God perfectly filled the body that he formed such that in the body of Christ was the fullness of God and it pleased him. It pleased God that Christ would be truly God and truly man. Now, why did it please God to have his fullness dwell in Christ? Why did it please the immortal, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, wonderfully creative, good God to have his fullness dwell in a human body? Because in God taking on flesh, Christ alone became uniquely qualified to accomplish salvation. The man who could become the curse and the God who could remove the curse as far as it is found. The man who could become sin and the God who could destroy sin in its totality. The man who could suffer an eternal death and the God who could eternally conquer death. The God who made creation, verse 15 to 17. And the image of God who would rule the new creation, verse 18. So how do we get there? Verse 19 and 20. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Are you beginning to understand and to grasp God's great plan of salvation for his glory, brothers and sisters? The plan of salvation was cosmic in proportion. Cosmic in time and space. A plan where the eternal God would be in a relationship with a renewed humanity of which he himself was the head. And he would be in relationship with them and he would dwell with them. And he would dwell with them in a renewed creation under his rule that in a cosmic symphony would declare his glory forever. A creation where heaven and earth were reunited. All things visible and all things invisible filled with the image of God. never to be corrupted again, never to fall again, never to see pain, suffering, death, or anything else again, something so high, so lofty, so incomparably glorious that you could get so caught up in its splendor and so lost in its vastness if it were not for that sight that was so much more glorious than all of this, the sight that grounds us, where we see the fullness of God in all his love and kindness and mercy and goodness and creativity and justice, where we find ourselves grounded at the foot of the cross, where we behold the true image of of the invisible God who made God's glory known as Christ alone made peace by shedding his blood to satisfy God's wrath on a cross. It was at the cross that Christ alone satisfied the full fury of God's wrath from heaven to bring peace to rebellious sinners like you and me on earth. So what makes Christ alone uniquely qualified to accomplish his plan of salvation? Because Christ alone can redeem humanity and creation. It is through this cross that Christ alone will bring many sons to glory because he has destroyed their sin and their curse as far as it is found It is through this cross that Christ alone will free all creation from their bondage and he will conduct them in that cosmic symphony to declare the glory of God. 
And it is through this cross that Christ alone will reunite heaven and earth, that humanity will once again be able to dwell with their God, never to be corrupted again. Because Christ alone eternally dwelt, dealt with sin at the cross. And by his resurrection, he shows us that he has dealt with that sin and his life is indestructible and his righteousness is incorruptible. It's never going to happen again under Christ. He will connect this new humanity, which is the church. He will connect it organically to his life, ruling the new creation with his hand and declaring the, God, the glory of God forever and ever in a resurrected body. And this is the main point of our time this morning, that we lose the good news if Christ alone is not the source of our salvation. That great truth, brothers and sisters, is that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone. But if your faith is not placed on the right object, it means nothing. It doesn't matter how much faith you think you have and it doesn't matter how much evidence you think you display of your faith. If you are not putting your faith in Christ alone, it means nothing. If you're not putting your faith alone. If your hope of your salvation is that you have come to church or, or that you come to church or that you practice good works or, or you're, you're a generally good person or if your, your faith is you're partly relying on the fact that you are saying prayers to God, this means absolutely nothing. You think you, those prayers are going to redeem the image of God? You think they're going to redeem creation? It's out of your mind. Not only can't you earn your salvation, but you don't even deserve your salvation. Christ could have renewed his image himself, but he has chosen in love, in grace, to have rebellious people who have sinned against an infinitely holy God to participate in his glory by being in him. And so you have no chance, not after rebelling against him, not after ruining his creation, and especially not after defacing his glorious image in this creation. But God offers us redemption for free. He offers us the forgiveness of sins. He offers us eternal life for free. That if you would put your faith alone in Christ alone because of who he is and what he did to save sinners like yourself and like myself, you can have redemption. It's a glorious truth. So what are we to do with this? To my brothers and sisters in Christ who are trusting alone in Christ alone for their grace by God to have eternal life. What do we do with this glorious truth? What does it mean for us who have the forgiveness of sins? Brothers and sisters, I cannot go outside of God's spirit-breathed words on either side of our passage this morning. What are you to do with this truth? Paul says this. Walk in a manner that is worthy of Christ. Continue to endure life's hardships until he returns or calls you home. Rejoice in your sure inheritance because of his resurrection that demonstrates he made peace by the blood of his cross. And remain grounded. Always remain grounded at the foot of the cross. Because you see, if you are struggling with godliness, if you think, I don't know how I can walk in a manner worthy of Christ, if you are struggling with affliction, if you are struggling with despair, if you're struggling with your own assurance, the answer is all the same place. Look to Christ alone. Look to what he did to save sinners like you and me and press on until all is new and he is with us forever. I don't have the points up on the slide, but just look at it in the text. We lose the good news if Christ alone is not the source of our salvation. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, you are glorious. We thank you for the Reformation, Father. We thank you that it has reclaimed the truth that, the truth that you set forth in your Son, Jesus Christ, and has built up in the church for the last 2,000 years. We thank you that you have offered us the forgiveness of sins through your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us see and understand how incomparably glorious you are through your Son, 
your image, the eternal God, the eternal Son. We thank you for him. We thank you for his sacrifice. May we never lose sight of it. And Lord, we would just pray, stir our hearts to desire your glory. Let us not be content with a creation that is still subject to your futility. Let us not be content with what everything that we see in the visible created order. Spur our hearts to desire the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to fully and finally finish the job and bring heaven to earth once again so that we might be with you forever. We thank you, God, and we pray in the name of your Son who is truly glorious. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.